All right, let's do the addition of hydrobromic acid to alkenes. We're going to talk about the basic pattern of this reaction. We're going to go through a couple of examples. We're going to go through the mechanism of this reaction in detail and then finish up with some important things to watch out for. All right, basic pattern of this reaction. Well, we're starting with an alkene. We've got a carbon-carbon pi bond. Uh, the carbon here is attached to R, which is some generic carbon group. We're adding HBr, which is hydrobromic acid. It's a really strong acid. Our product here is an alkyl bromide. Let's look at the key bonds formed and the key bonds broken in this reaction. We're forming carbon bromine. We're forming carbon hydrogen. We're breaking carbon-carbon pi bond. And we're breaking hydro hydrogen bromine bond. So if you notice, we're breaking a carbon-carbon pi bond. And we're forming the bromine and the hydrogen where the carbon-carbon pi bond used to be. So this makes this class, this reaction in the class of reactions called addition reactions. And the class of addition reactions is really quite large. In an introductory organic chemistry course, you'll easily encounter well over two dozen important addition reactions. And this is a classic example. Every addition reaction, we're breaking a carbon-carbon pi bond and we're adding two new bonds, signal bonds to carbon. And in this case, those two atoms that we're, we're adding are bromine and hydrogen. Okay, second important pattern to look for, for is where we're putting the bromine is not random. There's actually a really important pattern to recognize when we're adding the, the bromine to uh, HBr to the alkene. Let's look closely at the alkene. If you look on the left-hand side of the alkene, it's attached to one R group, which so it's a carbon-carbon bond. Uh, it's also attached to one hydrogen. On the right-hand side of the alkene, it's attached to two hydrogen atoms. So we ask ourselves, how are the how is the substitution pattern different on this alkene? Well, this on the left-hand side of this alkene, it's actually what we call more substituted, meaning it's more carbon atoms. The right-hand side of the alkene is less substituted, so it's got fewer carbon atoms. The rule is, when we add a hydrobromic acid to this alkene, the bromine always ends up on the more substituted end of the alkene, i.e. the carbon has the most carbon atoms attached. The hydrogen always ends up on the less substituted end of the alkene, so it has the least number of hydrogens, at least number of carbons attached, the most number of hydrogens. So, this pattern actually has a name. It's called Markovnikov's rule. And this reaction has the pattern. It's called Markovnikov selective. And this is a classic example of Markovnikov's rule. Let's go through some examples so we can apply what we talked about in terms of Markovnikov's rule and the pattern of bonds formed and bonds broken to some different molecules. This first example, we've got cyclohexene with a methyl group on the top. So let's analyze the pattern of this alkene and try and predict where the product's going to end up. On the top part, we've got two carbons attached. On the bottom, we've got one carbon and one hydrogen. Now, the hydrogen actually wasn't shown here. Uh, it's what we call an implicit hydrogen or a hidden hydrogen. And by the several weeks into the course, you'll notice that most of your structures are drawn this way. It's really important, if you don't see this, to be able to recognize where hidden hydrogens are in a molecule. And this is one example. We add hydrobromic acid to this, to this molecule. Notice the top part is attached to two carbons, so therefore this is the more substituted end of the alkene. So the bromine is going to end up there according to Markovnikov's rule. Hydrogen is going to end up to the less substituted end of the alkene, so we're going to have two hydrogens on the bottom. This next example, propene, we have we look at, ask ourselves the same question about this alkene. Which end of the alkene is more substituted? Well, this alkene is attached to one carbon, one hydrogen, this end of the alkene. The right-hand side of the alkene is attached to two hydrogen atoms, which again are not drawn, they're implicit. So when we ask ourselves what end of the alkene is more substituted, well, the left-hand side of the alkene is more substituted. Therefore, the left-hand side of the alkene is going to be forming a bond to bromine. The right-hand side of the alkene is going to be forming a bond to hydrogen. And this is the product of this reaction. This is a classic example, again, of Markovnikov's rule in action. This last example is a little bit tricky. So look at this alkene. If you look on the left-hand side, it's attached to one carbon atom, and it's attached to one hydrogen atom, which again, I didn't draw. The right-hand side has got one hydrogen atom and another carbon atom. So we ask ourselves, which end of the alkene is more substituted? Well, they're both attached to one carbon atom each, meaning they're equally substituted. So we ask ourselves, well, bromine is going to add to the more substituted atom of the alkene, but what if they're equally substituted? Well, if they're equally substituted, then there's no selectivity for this reaction. In fact, we end up with a mixture of products, and that's what I've shown here. We've got a mixture of products where the bromine's added to this end of the alkene or to the right-hand side of the alkene. And so you see that we have this product on the left, which is where bromine adds on the left, and the product on the right, where bromine adds to the right. Now, one little note about this product on the right, if you notice, it's a stereocenter. So that means that 
since we have no chiral influences in this reaction, this is actually going to be a mixture of enantiomers, a racemic mixture of enantiomers. And anytime you form a stereocenter in these reactions, assuming there's no chiral influence, you're going to get a mixture of enantiomers. Okay, let's talk about the mechanism of this reaction. So the mechanism of this reaction involves, we have two bonds formed, two bonds broken. We're going to show three arrows in this reaction. And it's going to proceed from our alkene. Um, the alkene is the electron-rich component of this reaction. It is the nucleophile. And the hydrophobic acid is the electron-poor component of this reaction. It is the electrophile, specifically the hydrogen of the HBr is the electrophile. And you think about the polarization of this hydrogen-bromine bond, the bromine being more electronegative is going to have the majority of electron density of this hydrogen-bromine bond. Hydrogen is going to be more delta positive. So what's happening is the alkene, the electrons from this pi bond between carbon 1 and carbon 2, are uh, the is the nucleophile in this reaction, and it's the electron-rich component. It's going to add to the electron-poor component, uh, the, the, the uh, delta positive charge on hydrogen. Now, the curved arrow notation here is kind of ambiguous. It's not absolutely clear from this curved arrow whether we're forming a bond from carbon 1 to hydrogen or forming a bond from carbon 2 to hydrogen. So I drew in this little red dashed line kind of guide us along to make it a little bit more clear that we're forming a bond from carbon 1 to hydrogen in this case. So arrow A is showing us breaking carbon 1 to carbon 2, the pi bond, and we're forming carbon hydrogen. Arrow B, since hydrogen is monogamous essentially, we can't have more than one bond at hydrogen. We've got to break a bond at hydrogen. That's what arrow B is showing. Arrow B is showing us breaking the hydrogen bromine bond. And in this case, we're ending up with um, we're going from sharing this pair of electrons between carbon 1 and carbon 2. Uh, carbon 1 is still sharing a pair of electrons with this hydrogen, but carbon 2 is now lacking an electron. It's gone from sharing to lacking, and therefore that's going to make it uh, a carbocation or a positively charged carbon. Note that we're putting the carbocation on the more substituted end of the alkene. And this comes back to Markovnikov's rule. We're putting the carbocation on the more substituted end of the alkene, of what used to be the alkene, because this is going to be the more substituted carbocation, which is going to mean that it's the more stable carbocation. So repeat that again. We're going to form the more stable carbocation, which in this case is a secondary carbocation. If we'd added the hydrogen to carbon 2, we would have ended up with a primary carbocation, which is much less stable and therefore much less likely to form. So Markovnikov's rule stems from the fact we're always forming the most substituted, therefore the most stable carbocation in every reaction. Okay, let's look at the third arrow. So the third arrow is when we're taking bromine, and a lone pair from bromine is coming to the carbocation on carbon 2, and we're simply forming a bond. That's all that's happened in this third arrow. So we're forming carbon 2 to bromine, and, and that's our product. Um, that is the sum total of all the bonds that are formed broken in this reaction. One little extra detail to keep in mind with this reaction. Well, first of all, we're forming a carbocation. And think about what's the geometry of a carbocation? Well, carbocations are flat. And what is this product here? Well, if you look closely, you'll note that this is actually a stereocenter. It's attached to four different things. So the question would be, when we're starting with an achiral molecule, such as this alkene, uh, we're ending up with a potentially chiral product, such as this uh, molecule with the stereocenter. Uh, how, does this, how does this happen? So if you think about the carbocation, remember it's flat, it's sp2 hybridized. When this bromine atom or bromine ion comes in, it can attack from either the top face of the carbocation or from the bottom face. And in this case, it's going to happen with essentially a one-to-one -one likelihood, 50-50 likelihood of attacking from the top or the bottom. So we're actually going to get a 50-50 mixture of the products that arise from attack at either the top or the bottom. So this is actually going to be a racemic mixture of products. So in this case, we're forming a stereocenter, but it's a racemic mixture of stereocenters. That's all I have to say about the addition of uh, hydrophobic acid to alkenes. If there's something important I've missed, if there's some important, if there's some, uh, I'd love to hear any suggestions or improvements or uh, any other sort of feedback you have about these videos. Uh, I'm, this is my second video. Uh, so uh, I'd love it if you just totally grill me in the comments. That would be fantastic. Thanks for taking the time to watch it, and I'll be back with the next a new video uh, sometime.